Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast. In particular, I want to mention the amazing world of radio, amazing.greatdetectives.net. Over there, every Wednesday, we're adding a new episode with this summer's theme as voted by our Patreon supporters, being a summer of summer replacement programs. So we'll Playing a wide variety of different programs. We started out with the sitcom Granby's Green Acres, and uh, then uh, we moved to a dramatic anthology, Minute C, and this week we'll have something different coming up. Uh, so I do encourage you to go check it out and enjoy all the programs we're going to be bringing you uh, this uh, summer, and you can also go back and listen to uh, some of the previous series we've done, including our summers of Humphrey Bogart and also Angela Lansbury. Just check that all out at amazing.greatdetectives.net, and you can view all our other podcasts over at the main page at greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of The Fat Man. The original air date, June 23rd, 1955, and the title is Murder Shows Eyes in the Dark. There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Weight, 239 pounds. Fortune, danger. Uh. Who is it? The Fat Man. And now, here's the Fat Man in... Murder shows eyes in the dark. Volume clock on top of my office desk said 10 to 5 on the phone rang. I don't know why, but when I started to pick up the receiver, I noticed the rays of the setting sun as they came through the window and landed on a dark red blot atop my desk. For some odd reason, it reminded me of blood. Hello? Is this Mr. Runyon's office? Mr. Runyon speaking. Oh, you're the private detective they call the fat man? Among other things. My name is Craig, Mrs. Brandon Craig. I have a job for you. What kind of a job? Well, I'd rather not explain over the telephone. Are you available for $500? For $500, I'm not only available, I can almost give you an exclusive contract. The address is 772 Crest Avenue, Kent House Apartment. Are you sure you don't want to give me an idea of what this is all about? I can only say you're going to have to earn your money, Mr. Runyon, in a very unexpected way. Yes, sir? Uh, Mrs. Craig, please. Who shall I say is calling, sir? Brad Runyon. I'm sorry, sir, but Mrs. Craig is not available right now. What do you mean she's not available? She called me 20 minutes ago and told me to come over. She's not seeing anyone, Mr. Runyon. Look, Jeeves. Willis is my name, sir. Mrs. Craig said it was important. Now, are you going to let me through? Please, don't goad me into forcing you out with my hand, sir. You're big enough to try. It might be fun. Willis? Willis? I'll handle this. Very good, madam. Mrs. Craig? Yes. I'm Brad Runyon. Who? The fat man. Obviously. But just what did you want? Are you kidding? You please take your business and leave. Say, what kind of gag is this? Maybe my bankroll doesn't rate a penthouse, lady, but I have to work for a living, and when I come traipsing up... All on... right. All right. Here. That's this. Twenty dollars for your trouble. Now, please go. In other words, you've changed your mind. Yes. I was just going to ask you why, but... That isn't necessary now. Good. My eyesight's pretty fair, Mrs. Craig. 
But I wouldn't need to be an eagle to look over your shoulder through the open door of that bedroom. And see what, Mr. Runyon? The body of a man on the floor. The top of his head blown off. He's got no identification. Who is he? A man named Robert. You called the police? No, not yet. It only happened a few minutes ago. He was the reason I told you before, Mr. Runyon. He's been seeing my daughter, Lois, and I felt he was dangerous. And I wanted to hire you to protect her. Where is she now? Well, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. No. You see, I killed him. He he forced his way into my house a few minutes ago, and he threatened to strike me. I, I killed him in self-defense. Where's the gun? The gun? Oh, why, I, I, I threw it away. Where? I don't remember. Isn't it enough that I admit the murder? What more do you want? Proof, Mrs. Craig. You say you shot him in self-defense. What did he try to do, attack you with his fist? Yes, yes, that's it, Mr. Runyon. Then how come the bullet entered his head through the back? The back? What are you trying to do, protect your daughter? She didn't kill him. She couldn't have killed him. Lois isn't a murderess. Now, let's have the truth. When did you find the body? Ten minutes ago. I called you from a drugstore. I'd been away from the apartment all the afternoon, looking for Lois. Where was this cultured gorilla at the time? Willis came in after I did, Mr. Runyon. And who frisked the corpse? What? Who searched the body? Has it been searched? His pockets are inside us. They didn't crawl out of his coat and pants by themselves. I went to his pocket, Mr. Runyon. Not for money, I presume. What are you holding in your fist, Mrs. Craig? Let's have it. it it's just the key. Taken from Robert? Yes. Ken station number 871. Do you know what that means? This key fits a public locker in Pennsylvania Station Number 871. At any rate, we'll find out soon enough. Right after I call the police. The lockers are over on this side, Mackenzie. Hey, you say Mrs. Craig admitted killing this guy. But her story didn't make much sense. She seemed to be covering for a daughter, Lois. Uh, here are the station lockers. Number 871. Uh, there it is. Hey, what's inside, Brad? This. A woman's purse. And heavy, too. Uh, I had an idea a lipstick wouldn't wear that much. That gun's a German Luger, Brad. With two bullets missing. Yeah, what else is in that bag? A compact. With a name engraved on the top. The name is Lois, the daughter of Mrs. Craig. <laughs> You're free to go now. You're released from custody. Mr. Runyon. Well? Are you still interested in handling this case? My original offer still stands. You may be paying to help put your daughter in the chair. I'll take that chance. I still think you'll get additional evidence and, and save her. I'm not making any promises. I'll do what I can. Oh, you'll have your check in the morning mail. Good day, Sergeant McKenzie. I'll be at home if you want me again. Well, Brad, you made yourself an easy fee. Thanks, so, Mac. Well, all we have to do is locate the girl and the case is finished. It seems to me that you've overlooked one minor item. Have I? We found the gun in the girl's bag in the station box. But what was the key doing in Robert's pocket? But it wasn't found in Robert's pocket at all. No. Under questioning, Mrs. Craig admitted she really discovered the key in her daughter's jewel case. <laughs> Onion? Yes. I've been trying to reach your office for an hour. I just got in. Who's this? Mrs. Craig's daughter. Welcome home, Lois. Don't try to trace this call, Mr. Runyon. It won't do you any good. What's on your mind? I want to know if I can trust you. That all depends. You're getting kind of popular with the police. They think that I killed John Roberts? Their suspicions run in that direction. Well, I didn't. And I can prove it to you. Oh, well, get at it. Can you meet me in half an hour? Where? Stand on the corner of 5th and 12th Streets at 8 o'clock sharp, and I'll have someone pick you up. Do you want me to wear a red geranium in my buttonhole? This is not a laughing matter, Mr. Runyon. I'm not even snickering. Look for a black sedan at 8. If there's anybody with you, you won't hear from me again. Hello? 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 May I come in? <laughs> You're in already. 
You're the fat man. You're real sharp, aren't you? And you're looking for the girl who killed John Roberts. Who are you? Lucille Roberts, his wife. Sit down. Have you found her? Have I found who? Lois. What makes you think I'm looking for Oh, she killed John and you know it. Look, I've got a proposition to make to you. I like propositions. Stop making. When you locate Lois, if you give me five minutes with her before you turn her over to the police, I'll pay you a hundred dollars. That's twenty dollars per minute for someone else's time. Not bad. Will you do it? The police might let you see her for ten minutes and for nothing. But I don't want her turned over to the police, Mr. Runyon. No. Why not? Because I want to kill her myself. <laughs> I arrived at System 12th Street at 7.50. There was a convenient lamppost on the corner to lean again. I had a quick smoke as I watched the thin stream of traffic passing by. 12th and 5th is in the village. But it's a far cry from the cafeterias nearby where the long-haired poets and the long-winded writers discuss their art with a capital A. The section I was in was quiet and its elegant subdued. At 8 sharp, I saw a black sedan slow up and park across the street. It was a big job, and the guy behind the wheel was in proportion. He gave me over and made sure I was alone. Then he nosed his car across the street and pulled up alongside him. Somehow I wasn't surprised when I recognized his face. It was Mrs. Craig Butler, Willis. Good evening, Mr. Runyon. Out for a drive and a little fresh air, Willis. It's not a bad idea, sir. Won't you step in, please? Where are we going? You'll be aware of our destination, sir, when we arrive. You may not know it, Willis, but you're playing with dynamite. Really, sir? Lois is wanted by the police for murder. So I understand. And withholding information from the police doesn't exactly get you in good with the DA. I'm prepared to accept full responsibility for my act, Mr. Runyon. That's mighty big of you. If you don't mind my saying so, I'm not a very appreciative audience. Sarcasm. And I don't like being driven around to strange places like a four-year-old in a kiddie car. I'm taking you where you want to go, Mr. Runyon. Isn't that sufficient? That all depends on what I find when I get there. You sound like you're still taking driving lessons, Willis. I'm sorry, sir. It's something I can't avoid. You see, I occasionally find it rather difficult to maneuver this car with a revolver. <laughs> Will you step into the living room, Mr. Runyon? I'll mix you a drink, sir. Don't bother. I'm not thirsty. Hello? Hello. You're right on time, Mr. Runyon. Am I? I'm low. Will you have a drink? Not right now. Leave the glasses on the table, Willis. Very good, miss. You know, you surprise me. Do I? I heard that they call you the fat man. And I expected to meet some overstuffed individual with enormous jowls and stubby fingers. But you're not like that at all. I'm not exactly anemic either. You're virile. That's the word that describes you perfectly. Virile. And interesting. All right, Lois. I'm practically wallowing in your charm. Let's get back to this. <laughs> oh, there really isn't any hurry. There was when you had me on the phone a little while ago. What do you do, specialize in quick changes? I wanted to get to know you before I asked you to help me. Okay. We're old pals. Now, what's the gimmick? First of all, let me tell you that I did not murder John Roberts. I was not with him at, at all on the day that he was killed. That's an alibi that might be useful, providing you can get someone else to back it up for you. Willis will testify to that. Willis? Well, that's fine. The DA will be glad to hear it. Especially when he finds out that Willis likes to carry a forty-five in his car. I tell you, I had nothing to do with John's death. As a matter of fact, I broke off with him the day before. Why? Because I found out he was only interested in me for my money. Where have I heard that tune before? Oh. I suppose I loved him at one time, but that's all in the past. It was ancient history before he was killed. Sounds like a good yarn, Lois, but the edges need polishing. What do you mean? Your handbag was found in Penn Station with a murder weapon inside. The murder weapon? It was a German Luger. The kind that makes a hole as big as your fist. I don't know anything about a gun. And I don't know how it got in my bag. That's not an alibi anymore, honey. 
That got the denial. You can say no until the cows come home. The evidence still says yes. Mr. Lennon. Yeah? How can anybody as interesting as you be so stubborn? I am not stubborn, Lois. I just learned how to add two and two when I went to school. Don't you want to help me? If you want my help, you'll have to play according to the rules. Anything you say. What else do you know about this case? I know who killed John Roberts. All right, who? His wife. That's as good a guess as any. I tell you, she murdered him. That's why I asked you to come here. I know that you can prove it. You mean you want me to try? Would you? I will on one condition. <laughs> Go on. You give yourself up to the police and we start from scratch. What? You heard me. Are you crazy? Not particularly. Do you want me to stick my head in a noose? It's in one already. You've got nothing to lose. Haven't I? You can't hide out forever. I can see that you and I will never agree. You're making a big mistake, Lois. The longer you hide out, the guiltier you look. And you want me to give myself up? That's right. All right. I will. When I get good and ready. Oh. It must have been Willis who slugged me from behind. I tried to turn and grab his leg, but he came down with it once more. That was all I remembered for a long, long time. A year later, maybe it was only an hour, I started to come to. Somebody seemed to me pushing me underwater. I couldn't catch my breath. Then I opened my eyes and saw that my ocean was just a trickle of water coming from a leaky faucet, dropping into a filthy sink in the corner of the room. I didn't know where I was, but even with a housing shortage, I wouldn't have picked a dump like that to live in. The floor was littered with rubbish, and the walls seemed to be renting out space exclusively to termites. I was lying on a dirty cot with my hands tied behind me, and my feet bound at the ankles. I couldn't move, and my head felt like a locomotive steam box with the pressure up. But I could hear. And I wondered if the guy who was sneaking up behind me was going to slug me again. Mr. Bunyan. Well, Mrs. Roberts, fancy meeting you here. I trailed you when you left your office. I followed you to that apartment and then waited outside. I saw that big man drag you out and drive you here. Incidentally, where is that big man? He's hiding his car in the brush. We're in a shack outside the city line. My car's about a quarter of a mile down the road. The conversation is interesting, but I'd appreciate a little more action on getting these ropes out. Well, I, I'm trying, but not so tight. There's a penknife in my vest pocket. No, the lower left one. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I've got it. Easy now. Hey, don't mistake my wrist for a side of ham. Yeah. There. Your arms are free. Oh, he's coming back. I can see him through the window. Get behind that curtain, quick. But what are you going to do? Lie here with my hands behind my back temporarily. Mr. Runyon. Oh, are you awake, Mr. Runyon? Oh, what hit me? I did, sir. You showed uh, very bad judgment in trying to struggle after the first blow. Oh, I hear that. What did you say, Mr. Runyon? Bend over so I can tell you something. I, I'm too weak. Uh, Certainly, sir. There. I can hear you now, sir. Then listen to that. Give me that knife so I can free my leg. What did you do to him? Dislocated his jaw, I hope. 
Ah, that's that. All right, there's another piece of rope on that chair. I can make knots as well as he can. Are you going to leave him here? He'll get his ride back to town in a cop's prowl car. I've got too many things to do to lug him along. You say you saw him drag me out of that house? Yes. Lois was with him. What happened to her? He dropped her off at a Crest Avenue apartment house. Number 772. That's where her mother lives. I know. I followed my husband to that house on the day he was killed. I've been doing a little detective work on my own, Mr. Runyon. Ever since I found out about the fancy presents John was getting from that girl. You say you followed your husband to the Craig apartment house on the day he was killed. I waited outside the entrance for over an hour. Then when I saw you go in, I left. Do you know what Lois looks like? I've seen her with my husband in one of their hideaways. And I've seen her with her mother. And the day Roberts was killed, you didn't recognize anyone who went in or out of that house except your husband and me. That's right. Come on, then. Let's get started. I've got a little date in town with a female wasp. Oh, Mr. Ronnie. Hello, Mrs. Craig. Is your daughter here? She's inside. Oh, I'm so glad you came. I was afraid I, I wouldn't be able to hold her much longer. Hold her? For what? For the police. I called them 20 minutes ago. I I guess it's no use, Mr. Runyon. I'm convinced now. Lois killed John Roberts. And as miserable as I feel about it, she'll, she'll have to pay the penalty. Oh, yes. You feel miserable about it, all right. Lois, you got to see me in a spot like this, aren't you? You hated me ever since you met my father. Ever since she what? Lois is my stepdaughter, Mr. Runyon. I married her father two years ago. He died a few months later. Lois believes I resented her. But that isn't true. Oh, no. You're just crazy about me, aren't you? Mother. That's why you pulled a gun on me when I came back home. That's why you called the police. I'm sorry about that gun, dear, but it was the only way I could bring you to your senses and protect myself. Uh, would you mind turning that gun over to me, Mrs. Craig? Oh, not at all. Here you are. Thanks. The police, Mr. Ronion. I'll answer it. Well, Brad. Hello, Max. You're just in time for the party. Uh, is uh, this Lois? Yes. Well, nice work, Brad. Uh, not so fast, Max. You've got the wrong girl. What? You don't want Lois. You want a stepmother, Mrs. Craig. Mr. Ronion, what kind of a joke is this? A real unfunny one. You killed John Roberts and tried to pin it on your stepdaughter. Are, are you out of your mind? You neither came out of your house nor went in from the time John Roberts arrived. His wife was watching the entrance. You were inside that apartment all along. Oh, that's absurd. If you want a motive, Mac, check up on her department store account. When a woman her age starts buying solid gold cigarette cases for another woman's husband, it must be love. At least... Your kind of love, Mrs. Craig. You... Okay, just stand right where you are, Mrs. Craig, and relax. Robert threw her over for Lois, and when somebody like Mrs. Craig is given the go-by, anything's liable to happen. Yeah, anything at all. Judging by the job you did in your stepdaughter, you missed your vacation. You ought to go in for picture framing. Well, I'm afraid she won't have much time for that, Brad. We're going to keep her pretty busy for a while. Get out of my way. Hey, you come back here. Stay for that open window. Don't you come near me. Don't come near me or I'll jump. Come on down off that ledge. Mackenzie, wait. She's not going to jump. You keep away from me, Roger. We're 11 floors above the ground and the sidewalk's hard. You know what you look like after you hit, don't you? <laughs> Oh. It won't be very pretty, Mrs. Craig. Hey, easy, Brad, easy. There's nothing to worry about. Is there, Mrs. Craig? Why, you... You're through and you know it. Now come off that window ledger. I'll come after you and yank you down. <laughs> well, which is it going to be? <laughs> Don't touch me. I'll come down. <laughs> Who's this? Lois. I uh, wanted to say.
thank you. For what? Refusing to press charges against Willis when the police picked him up. I still don't know why I did it. I must be getting senile. You did it because you knew he was only trying to protect me, and he knew nothing about the murder. Stop reminding me of it. I might change my mind. I'd, um, also like to apologize for what happened in my apartment. I didn't want Willis to hit you, but I was too scared to stop him. Is there any way I can make up for it? I'll speak to the lump on my head and find out. Sergeant McKenzie said you were coming over to the apartment today. I want to get hold of your mother's correspondence. It may be needed at the trial. Do you think you could take an hour or two off to have dinner with me? I doubt it. I'm not a bad cook when I set my mind to it. We'll have, um, oysters. Big ones. And a two-inch steak. Uh, no thanks. Creamy mashed potatoes with a special sauce. Delicious artichokes. They're in season right now. Uh, with mayonnaise? Mm-hmm. And we'll top it off with crepes of vet oh. and a bottle of champagne. How about it? Just so we can part good friends. Oh. Oh, what time do we eat? At seven. And just to make quite sure you get here, I'll send Willis over with the car. Don't bother, honey. Just to make sure I get there, I'll walk. seems I spend my life in getting into trouble and getting out of it. But at the same time, I generally manage to get some other people in and out of trouble, too. Be seeing you again. So long. Welcome back. Well, I love that line where uh, she asked him, do they call you the fat man? And he said, among other things. And I hope his stomach is recovered enough from the meal that's referenced at the end of the episode ahead of next week's program. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now and received a comment on YouTube about the question of whether to do science fiction old-time radio program, or an adventure old-time radio program. And we have a comment from Cherie who writes, How about alternate alternate programs of adventure and science fiction? Well, thanks for the question, Cherie, and that is a good suggestion. Certainly doing uh, episodes every two weeks, that is still a regular schedule, you know, and that, that's kind of what we do with uh, public domain video theater. Uh, the challenge that I see at this point is that whether you do adventure or science fiction, uh, you're going to be involving some serialized stories, and so people are having to wait two weeks to find out uh, what happens next is, I don't know, I, I think that might uh, cause some difficulties for building listenership. I have thought about doing that at, in a way where you could have 52 weeks and at the end of that time, uh, you know, alternate back and forth, not having anything serialized that first year, and then let listener response and openness to a particular style of story determine, or at least have a influence uh, what we do overall. I think it would be tricky to figure out how to do that in a, you know, good comparable way. Because with the adventure series, I have a sense that what people are going to most enjoy are those sort of ongoing series like The Scarlet Pimpernel, uh, or Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, or uh, Bold Venture. 
and what people are going to most uh, enjoy with the science fiction will be the anthology programs. Things like X-1 or Dimension X. And the challenge, I guess, would be to come up with uh, a way to uh, treat both ideas, the science fiction and adventure, fairly. So it's a... It's a it's a challenging process, but we'll see where we go. Thank you so much for the suggestion, and I also want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Nancy, Patreon supporter since March 2016, currently supporting the show at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. Well, that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, I do encourage you to rate it and review it wherever you download your podcast, but... Join us back here tomorrow for The Man Called X, and we'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of The Fat Man. In the meantime, check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.